you would please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 will be our text this morning. Recently, uh, a television show that my wife and I have gotten into and have been watching it um, pretty consistently has been The Good Wife. Anyone watch that show? Anyone admit to watching that show? I'm the only one that will admit to, okay, there's one, two people that, that watch The Good Wife. Um, it's good drama, it's about lawyers and politicians, it's well acted, a lot of the episodes end in drama, you know, you end with, okay, what happens next? Honey, we gotta watch one more tonight, even though it's late. Okay, but if you've seen it, or basically, if you've seen any show on primetime recently, you'll note that shows such as this have numerous views of sex that regularly conflict with my values as a follower of Jesus. Um, on this particular show, one of the characters is bisexual. She's regularly going off to be with her boyfriend or girlfriend, depending on which mood she's in that particular episode. You know, also, the show simply assumes that when people get into a romantic relationship with each other, that means sex. I mean, come on. This is 2015. Adults dating and adults having sex are really synonymous. Even the teenagers on the show or having sex. Okay, now, granted, this is on CBS, so they don't actually show anything. You just know what they're doing, right? The assumption is that when two people become interested in each other, the next logical step, really the only step, is to have sex. I mean, then after a while, if the relationship works out, then you can talk about marriage. Now, the show does recognize that cheating on your spouse is mostly wrong, but only mostly, because if really you're unhappy, then maybe it's okay to cheat. But nobody on the show thinks you should wait till marriage to have sex. I mean, why would you do that? Okay, and I could pick any show on TV and get the same basic worldview, right? The default assumption is you meet someone, you have sex with them, then if you truly fall in love, then we can talk about getting married. Or maybe not. I mean, maybe we're just having fun with each other. This is just the way the world works today. I mean, waiting until marriage, that might have been okay for my grandparents' generation, but that's really old-fashioned. Nobody actually does that anymore. You know, one common assumption is that this kind of sexual promiscuity is a relatively new worldview. In fact, if my grandmother were still alive, she would gladly tell you about how much better TV was back when Ricky and Lucy slept in separate beds. Okay, I'm not sure how little Ricky got here, but it wasn't from, from the Ricardos sleeping in the same bed with each other. And so, preacher. Even if you could find me a Bible verse that speaks against premarital sex, it's just written to a different world. It's out of vogue. It's old-fashioned. Maybe people could live that way back in Jesus' day, back in ancient times, but you can't expect people to live like that now. Come on. Everybody's doing it. Okay, so I want to take you back to the Greco-Roman culture, the kind of culture that existed in Jesus' day, and I want to tell you that there is absolutely nothing new under the sun. Okay, yes, we have a culture today that says basically anything goes sexually, but I contend that in Jesus' day, it was even more so. All right, we have cable and the internet, but they had poets in the theater, and it was expected that what you did for entertainment was that you would go and see and hear stories of every kind of sexual position every kind of sex toy, every kind of innuendo, and every kind of dirty joke. Okay, in fact, I spent some time this week in my office researching Greco-Roman attitudes towards sexuality. Okay, and I was reading an academic paper written by a guy from Columbia University, this scholarly work on ancient attitudes towards sex and sexuality, and it was so dirty, I felt like I needed to clear my browser history after I was done reading this academic paper. Okay, I learned things I didn't know were physically possible. Again, all this is first century kinds of stuff. Okay, here was the basic attitude that was prevalent in society in Jesus' day. Right, among the cultural elites of society, 
it was generally expected that noble women would only have sex with their husbands. Okay, so if you're a noble lady, the expectation is the only person you have sex with is your husband. For everybody else, okay, noble men and every other level of society, which is just about everybody, the expectation was that you would cheat. Okay, the expectation was that you would lose your virginity at a very young age and that that wasn't a big deal. Everybody was doing it. Okay, so when we read what the Bible has to say about sex, especially when we read in the New Testament, this is not written by a bunch of old men who didn't know the ways of the world. The authors of your New Testament were surrounded by sexual standards that make what we see in our culture today seem pretty tame. And yet, in spite of what everyone else was doing, in spite of what was considered acceptable throughout their society, the New Testament maintains that as followers of Jesus Christ, we don't live like everyone else. Even if everyone is doing it, which they're not, they just say they are, but even if everyone else is doing it, we live to a radically different standard. Now, there are a lot of places in Scripture we could go to talk about sex before marriage, but the one I've chosen for us this morning is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, mostly because it's completely unambiguous and it's very straightforward. All right, hear the word of the Lord, Hebrews 13 verse 4. It says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. All right, if you're keeping notes on your bulletin this morning, the first thing to write down is really simple. Okay, number one is premarital sex is sinful. You can put a period right there because that's, that's all there is to it. Okay, premarital sex is sinful. You notice the end of verse four. It says, God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Okay, now that word sexually immoral is a translation from one Greek word. If you have an older Bible, uh, your Bible says fornicator. Okay, it says God will judge the adulterer and the fornicator. And fornicator is a great translation for that, except for the fact that nobody knows what a fornicator is anymore. So our new Bibles all translate it the sexually immoral. The only problem with translating it sexually immoral is then that's open to interpretation, right? Because someone else's definition of sexually immoral may be different than my definition of sexually immoral. And yet the primary usage for that word, which again the old Bible called fornication, is it means to have sex before marriage. Now, while verse, what verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 13 is saying is your marriage bed should be kept pure, and there's two ways you do this. One, you keep your marriage bed pure by after getting married not having adultery. That was last week's sermon. You can go on YouTube and see it if you weren't here. Okay? The second way you keep your marriage bed pure is before you get married, you don't have sex. Okay? God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. All right, I want you to think back again to what we talked about a couple weeks ago with the Garden of Eden. All right, this is where we get the first instructions on sex. Part of God's first creation was to create sex and to tell us to be fruitful and multiply. This is part of God's plan for the world. And God says the way you form a new family is a man and a woman leave their families and they form a new family with each other. The two literally become one flesh. Okay, he's talking about sex. The flesh of one enters the flesh of the other and you form this new family. So the idea that you can have unmarried sex and that in any way be okay is nonsensical. It goes against the whole way God designed it to work. Now, again, a lot of things we could say about that. There's three things I want to make about this point. Three points I want to make about this point. Okay, I've got an A, B, and C. All right, so here's A. And that is that society ignores the consequences of sex. Okay, just like any sin... Unmarried sex comes with consequences. Recently, there was a guy named Dr. Patrick Schneider, and he did a statistical analysis of couples living together without getting married in America. Okay, this is becoming increasingly popular. In fact, the divorce rate in America is going down, but in large part it's going down because fewer people are getting married. Instead, we're just all shacking up with each other. Okay, but he did a, st a statistical study of what happens when relationships just live together rather than getting married. 
Okay, and he found out that relationships are extremely unstable when you live together without getting married. In fact, only one-sixth of cohabiting couples are still together after three years. Only one in ten survives five years or more. Second thing he found is that in these situations, usually it's the woman who ends up with most of the responsibility. And without getting married, she has no legal protection. He can walk out the door at any time and completely leave her hanging. Typically, the woman in these situations contributes the majority of the income for the relationship. Okay, also, if he dies or something happens to him, she gets no retirement, she gets no pension, she gets no life insurance or anything else. There's no financial obligation because you didn't get married. Shacking up also brings a greater risk of STDs. Unmarried men are four times more likely to be unfaithful than husbands. Also, there's a great link between poverty and just living together. Uh, those who share a home but never marry have 78% less wealth than people who get married. Also, they suffer from, um, sorry, the ones who suffer the most from these situations are, of course, the children. The poverty rate of children of cohabiting couples is five times greater than the national rate for children in married households. In fact, children ages 12 to 17 with cohabiting parents are six times more likely to exhibit emotional and behavioral problems, and they're 122% more likely to be expelled from school. All right, we could do lots of statistics today, but basically what I'm trying to say is all the data points to something that the Bible already knew. Sex without marriage creates unstable relationships. Okay, again, we could spend the rest of the morning talking about the trouble you can get into with premarital sex, about how it leads to unplanned babies and diseases, horrible emotional baggage. I could give you statistics on all of those things. The only problem with statistics is people hear statistics and say, well, that's true for all of those people, but that won't be what happens in my case, right? But I'll tell you this, in, in a decade of ministry, I've worked with a lot of couples. My wife has worked with hundreds of couples. And out of all those couples that we've talked to, I've never heard someone say, boy, I really wish we'd had sex earlier. I've never heard anyone say that. Numerous times, I have heard people say, you know, I really regret losing my virginity when I did. You won't ever regret waiting. You know, again, I like sex. I am a fan of sex. But there is no night of passion that is worth the consequences of premarital sex. You will never regret waiting. You will always regret not waiting. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay. Okay, second thing, and I think this impacts all of us, even if you are married and have a normal, healthy sexual relationship with your spouse, but one of the problems that we face today is that society has made sex a god. What do we actually worship in America? You might be tempted to say money, and that's not a bad answer. There's certainly a lot of money worship going on in our culture today. But I think more than money, what we worship as a people is sex. You know, you watch a lot of commercials, and they aren't promising you that if you use their product, you'll get rich. They're promising you if you use their product, you'll have lots and lots of hot sex. So please, buy this product, right? We worship sex. We are constantly bombarded with images and stories which all teach us that sex is the ultimate experience. More than anything else you could ever do in your life, the one thing you want to do more than anything is sex. It is the most fun, the most fulfilling, the most loving, the most satisfying thing you can ever do in your life. And what we've done is we've taken something that's a good creation of God and we've translated it into the ultimate pursuit. We're so far fallen that we measure happiness by how much sex you have. We measure success by how much sex you have. We hear that sex is the be-all, end-all of life. We have literally made it into something we worship instead of God. Now again, sex is good. Sex is fun. God did a good job of creating it, but there are bigger things in your life than having sex. 
Do not let sex dominate your life because if all you're looking for is to have a physical encounter that fulfills your needs, you'll never be satisfied. And you'll miss out on the bigger things, the more important things that God is doing around you. You know, I know this flies completely in the face of what you see on TV, but you can lead a completely fulfilling life without ever having sex. Jesus lived without having sex. Paul lived his life without having sex. Lots of people live lots of wonderful lives and have been completely happy and well-adjusted without having sex. Sex is not the best thing in the world. Don't let it become a god. All right, C or sub-point number three, however you want to do that. And that is that society has made sex an identity issue. Okay, We've made it into an identity issue. This is a point we will hit again and emphasize even more next week. Next week we'll talk about homosexuality. Okay, But your identity and who you are as a person, the foundation of your being doesn't come from your sex and your sexuality. It is a mistake to let sex define who you are. You know, guys tend to define themselves in terms of accomplishments. Girls tend to define themselves in terms of relationships. So usually the way this works with sex is that guys will look at sex as an accomplishment. Okay, am I a virgin or not? How many girls have I had sex with? How good am I at sex? Girls tend to view sex as an aspect of relationships. Well, if we're really in love, then sex will draw us closer together. Or if I really want affection, then the way I can get it is by having sex. Okay, both of those views are completely wrong-headed because instead of defining ourselves first as a child of God, we define ourselves in terms of sex. Guys, your prowess isn't measured by sex. All right, sex does not make you a man. Any fool can get a girl pregnant. Right, most 12-year-old boys can get a girl pregnant. That doesn't make them men. Okay, that's not strength. True strength, truly being a man, is being in control of your body. It's not letting your body be in control of you. Okay, and girls, your self-worth doesn't come from how any boy thinks about you or treats you. Sex will not make him love you more. It will not draw you closer together. A guy is fully capable of having sex with you, and he doesn't care about you at all. Sex isn't going to make him like you better. Okay, the only thing sex can do is make it harder for you to have a meaningful relationship in the future because one of the qualities that good guys look for is a girl with purity. God knew what he was doing when he created sex. He knew what he was doing when he made it for a husband and wife to enjoy. Sex outside of marriage is sinful, and it has some pretty severe consequences. Now, just like we talked about last week with adultery, premarital sex can be forgiven. Okay? Any sin can be forgiven. The power of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is much more powerful than your sin, but it will make your life a whole lot easier if you just don't go there. All right, now, you may be tempted at this point in the sermon to say, Preacher, this is all fine for youth. This is fine for the single people here. But I'm married. Okay, this doesn't apply to me anymore. And to you, I say, we should consider the rest of Hebrews chapter 13. Okay, if you still got your Bible open, notice the context for verse 4. Go to Hebrews 13, start in verse 1. He writes, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
All right, to understand this paragraph of Scripture, I think the very first line sets the theme for all of it. Okay, notice again that first line. He says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. I think everything that follows that we just read is about defining what true love is. And Hebrews says several things that will show that you have a church community of true love. Okay, several things he lists out here. He says, you want to have a community of true love? Here's what it looks like. First thing is show hospitality to strangers. Then he talks about being with those who have been put in prison for the faith. Then he talks about keeping your marriage bed pure. He talks about the love of money. Several things in this one paragraph talking about how to have a community of true love. Now, I contend that the reason a lot of premarital sex happens is because people are looking for true love and they mistakenly think that sex and love are the same thing. I think Hebrews tells us that the way our people should experience and understand love is they will see and feel it in our Christian communities. In our churches, we should be experiencing true love with each other. And I think if we do a good job of living out true love in our churches, then we'll be a whole lot less likely to go out and look for it elsewhere. I think, number two, write this down, okay? Whether you're single or married or wherever you are in life, this is the most important point I make this morning, is sexual fidelity happens in a community of true love. Do you want to raise your kids and grandkids to be pure? that I think you teach them through your encouragement, your attention, and support what it feels like to be truly loved. Do you want our people not to use sex as an identity issue, as a way of figuring out who they are? Then I think we need to live our lives demonstrating that we are children of God and that that means something. And it means we live in a way that is radically different than the world around us. I want my kids to grow up feeling loved without having to go have sex to find it. I want my kids to grow up knowing who they are without having to root their identity in sex. I want them to know that there is a community of people behind them who loves them dearly and values them fully and that they get their identity from here, okay? And not from out there somewhere. So the responsibility for sexual fidelity is on all of us. What are we doing to create a community of love where our people can grow up in an environment where these temptations aren't that big of an issue? And you want to know something else that a community of love doesn't do? It doesn't gossip about the family members who have messed up. You know, I haven't seen this happen here, but I remember it happening in other churches I've been a part of where some, one of our young people would show up pregnant and the next thing that we all do is spend the rest of the next several months gossiping about it. That's not true love. The way that we fix one sin is not to compound it by making more sins, talking about the first sin. What does it look like for us to create a community of true love where healing and reconciliation and true identity can all take place? The final thought I want to leave you with is a question. That is, I want all of us to think, how can we do a better job of continually loving each other and supporting each other here at GCC? What does it look like for us to have a community of true love? All right, at this time in our service, we're going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. During the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. We would love the opportunity to talk with you or pray with you about anything that's going on in your life, about anything that's going on that we can help you with. If there's any need you have, please come forward. Talk to us now while we stand and while we sing.